No, I welcome you, Pastor Larson here, Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida, inviting you to our Bible study. It's on the air every Sunday at 10 o'clock at trinitydelray.org. You can watch it anytime at the YouTube place. And we invite you to our worship, which increasingly is having people come in person with all of the protections that are deemed necessary and required and uh, to help us stay safe. So you come at 8.30 and 10.30 if it feels good for you or stay home and watch it at trinitydelray.org and you will find that at, at those times uh, at that place. I'm Pastor Larson and this is our Bible study. Who is Jesus is the title of it. And uh, let's get started. Not only did Jesus fulfill many Old Testament prophecies and give witness to himself in divine teaching, he did many miracles and signs, and there were many who saw him and wrote down what he did in the Bible. We are reading some of those public miracles of Jesus that show him to be the Son of God with power. The miracles help us to say why we believe he is the Messiah, the Christ, whom the prophets wrote about. We pray that today the Lord will continue to use his word to give us more confidence in our faith. That would be a wonderful blessing. I pray it will be for you as well. Who is Jesus? It's an interesting question. The whole world needs to answer that question in the affirmative that Jesus is the Son of God with power who came to die and rise again to bring salvation to people through faith in his, his name. We're looking at the public miracles of Jesus. I say the public ones because there were others that were done that were not written in the Bible and we're not aware of them except in the general sense of the word. But now that's the subject. The public miracles of Jesus show and they reveal, and we will say prove, that Jesus is the Messiah. The Messiah, the one prophesied in the Old Testament. Think about the works of Jesus, especially the works that we call miracles, or that the Apostle John calls signs. What did he say about those works? We've had this passage before. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. It's interesting that he says, here are things that I do. It is this. It is as if they are talking to people. They bear witness about Jesus. If I am not doing the works of my father, Jesus said, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I am in the father. I want to say a few words about that last part of that last sentence, that you may know and understand the same Greek word is used for know and understand, except the first one is like an instantaneous know. When you learn something, then you have it. But the second know, which is translated here, understand, is a continuous action verb, and it means that you might know and continue to know. It's not understanding with the mind but the grasping of the heart by faith that you may know and understand. And the second thing I want to say about that sentence is this mystery. The mystery of the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Now that preposition in will cause you no end of problems if you try to figure out what is Jesus saying there? You believe in how many gods? One. One God. God. And we talk about three persons because 
we have no other way to talk about it. The word person is not mentioned in the Bible, but we see and experience the three persons, and yet there is still one God. Now we have an essential unity of the persons. If we don't have an essential unity of the persons, then we do has, have, as some accuse us, of having three gods, but there is but one God. Here, it is manifested in the person of Jesus, who was seen. They did not see the Father. They did not see the Spirit, except when the Spirit came in the form of a dove. I'm going to get off of this heavy and difficult theology in just a moment, but I want you to understand one thing, that when Jesus says, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, that we are one. I and the Father are one, he said in another place. So if you have any questions about that, I'll, I'll pause, but I think that we're going to end up with this mystery unsolved. Hmm. Okay with that? I'm not going to say, does that make sense to you? Because that would be the wrong question. It does not make rational sense, but it no. is true. Mystery of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. All right. The essential unity. That's all you need to know from that. That's all we can get from that mystery. All right. All right. Let's go on then and continue to ask this question. You know about modern medicine and you are grateful that God has used the research of the recent century and also the centuries before that established the foundation. There was a question on Jeopardy this past week about the history of medicine. And I thought, what a wonderful field from which to draw questions for Jeopardy. Do you realize how complex and detailed the history of medicine is? Mm -hmm. Judy, perhaps you studied it when you began your... Yeah, so, yeah some, of, some of it, a little bit of the history, yes. There were people who studied blood circulation. And there were people who got the microscope out and said, you know, there are little bitty things that are alive in there. There are cells that are dividing. And they saw them with mm -hmm. an electron microscope. It was a mystery mm -hmm. that had suddenly revealed itself. The history of medicine, it's an amazing thing. Modern medicine is at work every day in research laboratories all over the world, trying to solve some of the mysteries. And it's just an amazing thing that God has allowed us to do. And modern medicine as a way to heal, cure and restore and repair and strengthen many who suffer from various diseases. That's, that's quite a statement. Well, there's some that cannot be healed. Last week we had some numbers on the screen and we had something like 30,000 different diseases that had been cataloged, but only 10,000 of them have any uh, cure or relief. We're still working. Do you know, man has tried to push back the inevitability of death uh, since he arrived on the earth. <laughs> the denial of death does not make it go away. The acceptance of death does not make death go away, but it makes it a little more bearable. Right. And when diseases come, well, I'll ask you, Judy, what do you say to a patient who has a so-called, quote, terminal, end quote, disease? Oh boy, nothing. <laughs> Have you worked in hospice? As, 
as you know, and have just found out very sadly, you and Linda both have the same disease, but how it affects each individual is so individual yet. I mean, modern medicine has learned a lot but because we are all, God made us all so unique and different, we still don't know. We still don't know what, how many days we have in this world, you know, regardless of whether or not we have a disease or we think we're well and suddenly he takes us. So um, we have to just hope for each day and, and live each day um, as best as he would, he would want us to live in his joy and in his faith and in his happiness. That's right. I count every day precious. Pastor Larson. Go ahead. Um, the, uh, so as you probably recall, I was a dietitian in hospitals and, or you may not recall, but anyway, so I'm in the outer banks and, and I'm older. I mean, I had spent my almost whole life working in hospitals and my deal was to provide food, you know, or, or nutritional information. And the first time, because this was such a small hospital, I, and it didn't have actually a hospice section. There was only 30 beds in the Outer Banks. And so I came upon uh, the fact that this man was being withheld food and water. And it was like, I guess I hadn't been exposed to it before, but it was for his, his um, a palliative care. I, that's what the doctor explained to me. And um, and it was shocking, but it was to make death easier for that person. And Judy may have to get into that too. I don't understand it, but you well, know. Well, let's, let's put it this way. We don't withhold it. Yes. We allow the body as the body declines and the person can no longer safely eat and swallow. Right. Then, then artificial means are not... Um, probably given by nowadays with tube feedings or intravenous uh, total protein nutrition that can be given and those sorts of things. We allow the body to do its natural um, declining uh, and that's it. But to just say, because somebody's now in hospice, we're going to withhold food and water. No, I didn't say that. I did oh. not say that. No, okay. I would not say that. And we okay. all have these uh, health care, whatever that is, you know, the thing you, yeah. you write your name on. But um, no, this was a man who was, and, and he did die. And mm -hmm. I said, this, this hospital did not, ha it only had 30 beds. It didn't have a hospice care. Uh -huh. But that was the, uh, what the doctor told me they were doing. And mm -hmm. so I had, you know, I had to acquiesce to it because I was like, what are you doing? You know, like, I didn't understand yeah. that process. That it's it's, you know, it's, it's very complex as you as a dietitian, you know, from that view, uh, point of view. We always associate food with life. If you don't yeah. eat, you're not going to have life. That's right. a common human thing. Um, we used to have cancer patients. And of course, it was very difficult for spouses to continue to push, push, push. You've got to eat. You've got to eat. You've got to eat. And there have actually been studies where people have been allowed to eat what they want, which is probably about what we would say they, they estimated like 25% of what your nutritional intake should be. So if it's 1200 calories, you're only eating 400 calories a day. Cancer patients that only took in 25% actually sometimes lived longer than those that were force fed because when you were force feeding or encouraging people to eat that their bodies weren't ready in a cancer situation, it only fed the cancer cells and they grew faster and multiplied faster. Right. Whereas, whereas the individual that ate what they were comfortable eating had a more comfortable lifestyle and the cancer probably slowed down. And, you know, again, it depends upon the type of cancer. Yeah. So, you know, those are some, some, unique, so, some unique things that you learn and some um, fallacies that, you know, you have to, you figure out that aren't true. The no, same uh, thing after surgery, they say, don't feed the patient much, you know that's probably that same process well there, there's different things there i mean we're getting off subject right but let's say that uh, uh, to sum it up that it's hard to generalize because as you said we're we're each different and um, uh, if the staff is working correctly in the in whatever uh, facility we're talking about the staff is 
looking at that individual case and helping to make decisions. Uh, would you say that as a summary statement, Judy? Would that's, that a, that's, a, that's a good statement, in, including after surgeries, because there are certain reasons why you don't sometimes, um, you know, start food right away either. So. No, it depends on what kind of surgery. But okay. you know, we'll get off of medicine, except <laughs> to talk about the fact that modern medicine is is busy keeping us alive. And I think we all are are grateful for that because we love life. We love the life that God has given us. And we know that as long as we stay here, however long God decides, we can love other people for him. Amen. I can hug myself, but it's, <laughs> I can't do much hugging in this world except the genie that he has given me. All right, but who can raise the dead? You see my contrast? Modern yeah. medicine can cure and heal and restore many, but who can raise the dead? Wow. I thought about keeping these for the climax of, uh, we've had many miracles to go through yet. Yeah. <laughs> have, pa <laughs> have patience. <laughs> we won't study all of them in detail. Who can raise the dead? Those that Christ gives the power to do it, because some of the disciples did bring people back to life. In, a, in right. two or three cases. Let's talk about the ones that Jesus did. He raised the widow's son to life. I love this story. Mm -hmm. These two processions that meet in the valley of Nain. There is a valley between the two cities, and um, there is a place for uh, interment, we could say, to uh, in the caves is what they had in those days. Um, and so these two processions meet in this valley. And I'd like someone to read uh, this short passage from Luke 7. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bearer, and the bearers stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. Yeah. You know what this uh, beer is? Um, this God, is like a stretcher. This is like a stretcher. Right. He had been prepared for burial. The compassion of Jesus. And all mm. he does is touch the beer. <laughs> I say to you, arise. And the power of God in the person of Jesus Christ gives life. The interesting thing here is that this man was the only son of his mother. She was his only source of support, unless the church had taken her in. But this is very early. This is before Acts chapter 1 and 2 and 3, where that became part of the normal care. She was a widow. So Jesus raised the dead. Here's another case, another reader from Mark 5. I'll read. Then, then came, go ahead. D is up. <laughs> then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and buy your hand and lay your hand on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. There came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. 
Could you go on, please? Okay. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were there with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kumi, Kumi. which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking for she was 12 years of age and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Thank you, thank you. Going back to here, um, when someone dies, the there's a finality, no one can, mm -hmm take care of anyone after death. No one can raise the dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? All right, that's the, that's, that's the common thing. And I'm not talking about near-death experiences, which I, I don't have the medical training to talk about, so I won't talk about them. Um, I know they exist because we have many, many witnesses to that fact. But the child is not dead, but sleeping. Now, sleeping is a euphemism in the Bible used sometimes for those who have died. But he didn't mean they were sleeping. She was dead. All right. Jesus has the power to raise the dead. You probably have a question about verse 43. He charged them that no one should know this. Did that raise a question in your mind? Well, he said this a few times uh, after his miracles. Um, okay. I think maybe because he had so much work to do before his end and he didn't want any he didn't want the authorities coming and taking him before he could accomplish everything that he had to do yes i i you're you're really on the right track the evidence that he was the messiah began to hmm, spread and wherever he went there was a commotion of people bringing the the sick and the lame and the blind to him, and he healed them, as we have in many passages. Uh, that he almost encouraged, I mean, he couldn't stop it from happening. But the rulers who saw him as a threat, more and more began to try to silence him and to keep him from the people. He didn't have much success in that. And finally, after John 11, when they saw that they could do nothing, but that the, quote, the whole world has gone out after him, it threatened their position and their power. And they began more and more to make plans to have him killed, as you know, and they were successful in, in that um, awful, awful thing. To, to kill Jesus. And that last part touches on the question of medical necessity. Now that right. she's alive, Jesus said, give her something to eat. When he healed Peter's mother-in-law, the first thing she does, <laughs> the lady's going to laugh at this, I guess, but the first thing she does is began serving them. <laughs> um, I have under the roof of my house a wonderful gift named Janie and uh, her <laughs> duty and diligence she's not on right now so I can talk about her uh, her duty and diligence to go after what needs to be done just 
go way beyond my energies. And uh, I, I'm just amazed at what God has given me. Now that's enough of that. Uh, I'll, uh, it's better that I praise the, the Lord than uh, to praise her. She would be embarrassed by it. All right. So we have another climactic raising of the dead. Uh, yes. Someone else would like to read here? Mm -hmm. Did I hear Chris? Oh. Or Evelyn? Oh, I'll read. Uh, raises Lazarus from the dead, John 11, 14 to 15. After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against us. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would not, you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. Thank you for reading that rather long passage. We have, a, we have again this, um, this fallen asleep euphemism. Mm -hmm. But Jesus said, no, he is dead. And if you had read this story before, you would remember, I believe you would remember that Jesus delayed going. He delayed going to Lazarus' funeral. So that when he came, Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Martha doesn't want the cave to be opened because, well, it's just not going to be a pleasant place to be with the odor. Don't go there. But anyway, they did take away the stone and the father heard Jesus' prayer, and when Jesus cried, Lazarus, come out. I remember a, an aged pastor preaching a sermon on this text, and he asked rhetorically, why did Jesus call Lazarus by name? Do you know the answer? What you'd have to know is that there's a whole graveyard full of, of, of caves with stones rolled in front of them. I can't call it a cemetery. But if he had not said Lazarus by name, the whole graveyard of Bethany would have come out. <laughs> ah. <laughs> because it was not time for the general resurrection of all flesh. The man who died came out unbind mm -hmm. him and let him go. So Lazarus, um, go ahead. Pastor, yeah, having, yeah, just as, because what they did, I mean, what I saw one or two, uh, I, I did I did 
see in Israel too, but they, they carved niches into the walls of the caves. And, and so that kind of, you know, backs up what you said. I didn't know that before about this passage, but. Yeah, you know. the closest we could come to that would be maybe a mausoleum. Yeah, where all the bodies come out. <laughs> yeah, well, one day that will happen when Jesus comes again. So many of the Jews, therefore, who had been with Mary and seen what he did, believed in him. This is a miracle that could not be denied. And it, it stirred the, the enemies so much that they began to make those plans in earnest. And after John 11, there is a, an acceleration of things that happen and uh, Jesus is condemned. There's a short time span between the miracle here in John 11 and when you go to the upper room with Jesus and his disciples and that begins in John 13 you see now John is not strictly chronological but I'm saying there's not much time in between then and the upper room discourse when he's talking with them and he washes their feet and he prays to the father John 17, and then uh, the events begin to uh, accelerate toward the crucifixion from John chapter 18 in that. When you read the Gospel of John, you realize that almost half of it is the passion narrative and the resurrection. Mm -hmm. But I, I think we covered that before when we studied the Gospel of John uh, rapidly, thematically. Would you like to say anything more about these three raisings of the dead? No. Okay. Who is Jesus? Here's another miracle. Uh, someone read, please, from Luke 11. I think uh, who hadn't had a chance yet? Anyone? I'll read again. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> or didn't you want to read, Chris? I was. I was on mute, and I didn't even know it. Oh, okay. okay. Cast out a demon, Luke 11, 14 to 16. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke. And the people marveled. But some of them said he cast out demons like Beelzebul, the prince of demons, while others to test him kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. Yeah, the, the demon is mute. And that means it's a demon that causes muteness. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. So Jesus restores the ability to speak. That's probably not one of the most well-known yeah. uh, miracles of Jesus. But when you have uh, someone who has a natural disease, not a demon disease, but called a stroke, you know very well that one of the most common things, uh, right, Judy, that they lose is their ability to speak. Mm -hmm. Why is uh, the speech part uh, so sensitive to some kinds mm -hmm. of stroke? Well, our speech is located on, they say, our dominant side of the brain, I believe. Uh, let me correct that. And, then, and, um, and that's, you know, and that's kind of, it's, it's a matter of where the stroke occurs that uh, uh, it, uh, whether or not it'll affect the speech, so. All right. And sometimes it's not complete loss of speech, but the inability to uh, correctly form the sounds. Well, to form sounds or um, words. To some, I mean, there's there's many there's many different things that can happen, uh, especially with strokes or 
or, or what you want to say comes out in a completely different uh, group of words. Um, you know, if you wanted to say demon, you might say angel or something in that sort. Uh, your brain cannot comprehend the correct word to say. I see. Uh, a lot, lots and lots of uh, different uh, variations of speech problems as a result of a stroke. Right, yeah. Years ago, I visited a woman who could not speak. Um, she had been in the choir and it was a, a great loss to her not to be able to sing anymore in the choir. And she was pretty much kept to herself. Uh, she was in that assisted living center near uh, Congress and uh, Albright mm -hmm. on the west side. They're a beautiful place. Barrington. Uh, Barrington, thank you. Well. I gave her a copy of the Apostles' Creed as part of our communion service when I visited her to give her communion. And I put the words in 16 point type in front of her and I said, can you read this? And she said, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. When the words were presented to her, she could say them, but also remember that she had been saying this creed her entire lifetime as a lifeline a long member of the church mm -hmm. so there was an ability there to to call out but if i had said to her uh, do you believe in god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth the word yes might have been in her thought but not she couldn't produce it and there was another thing when I put a piece of music in front of her with words and we got the tune, there was another part of her brain that was able to bring the music out. It was mm -hmm. recorded in a different place. Mm -hmm. uh, that surprised her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, sometimes, we sometimes found that people had a, that had a hard time expressing themselves, uh, if you could get them to sing song it, they were able to say it in a sing song. Oh. We would pick some sort of a song that they knew. And actually they could then express their thoughts or concerns or, you know, I am hurting or I have a headache or whatever, something like that. Music. Yes, mm -hmm. music, music is very therapeutic. Mm -hmm. I took care of a, a lady uh, years ago who was a nurse in the English army. And they had told me that, um, she, she doesn't talk, she won't talk to anybody, she can't talk to anybody, but they just wanted me to be with her and take her out for a walk, which I did, and I talked all the time. I, I asked questions, she never answered. And one day I thought, I'm gonna start singing some war songs, and I did, and she, she joined right in and sang with me, and I thought, wow, this is really a miracle. Mm -hmm. She responded to music. Mm -hmm. So here's another uh, casting out of uh, and demons. Uh, uh, who can I ask? You can volunteer. Uh, let's see who else. I'll, I'll, if nobody else, I'll, st I'll start the list over again here. Okay. Does Carola want to read or not? It again. This is another one. And when, and when he came to the other side, to the country of the Cardenas, the Gadarenes. <laughs> Gadarenes. Yeah. Two demon possessed men met him coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them. And the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> that is, that is a, a difficult scene to comprehend. Yeah. 
recognize they recognized him as the son of God. Mm -hmm. And I've always wondered why pigs, you know, they, they could not eat, the Jews could not eat the meat of a pig. Mm -hmm. So I was always wondering if that's the reason, the, but I don't know why the demons wanted Jesus to send them into the herd of pigs. I'm not going to guess because you know what I do with speculation. You've been with me, uh, most of you, for long enough time where I, I can't teach speculation. Mm -mm. I don't know if it's true or not. And I only want to teach what is true. Let's go on to another miracle. Oh, no, I want you to do something. I want you to be active. No, you don't have to write this out and hand it in. This is not a grade school exercise. But we're studying the miracles of Jesus, and I want you to take a, take a stab at it. The miracles of Jesus, what? Anyone? Testify to the truth that he is the son of God. Really good, Evelyn. Anyone else? The miracles of Jesus? Oh, I guess testify to us uh, that he can raise us from the dead for eternal life. The power of the resurrection is prefigured in those three miracles of the raising of the dead. The miracles of Jesus, what? They show us who Jesus is. They do, absolutely. They show that he has power, that God has become in the flesh and he operates with all the power of God. It uh, shows us um, visual, physical um, proof, I guess. We always like to, our senses, see, hear, touch, and what have you to um, prove, prove the proof, see the proof. And many saw this and were amazed that he had these powers. You and I live with faith in this Jesus who has been revealed to us, and we have known these things about him all of our lives, most of us. Well, take someone who had never seen Jesus before in his day and sees the miracle. You see the effect that it has back mm -hmm. here. Uh verse 45, many of the Jews who had come with Mary and had seen what he did believed in him, all right? So that's what the miracles of Jesus do for us today because we read the witness of those who saw them. Well, let's, you, did very, you did very good. I think you all get A's. <laughs> How many miracles did Jesus do? <laughs> oh, my God. Trick question. Right. Endless ones. Endless. Wow. Was there 30 some? Yes, that are recorded. That are recorded. I, I found 37, but I'm sure there were more. There's the number. Ah, boy. No, I have 37. Oh, oh my God. gosh, you made your Wheaties today. I got them all. <laughs> you the gold star. Wow. Yeah, you know, that number was on Jeopardy the other night too. <laughs> ah. Not not the miracles on Jeopardy, just 37 was the and the answer to all of them. 37 that are recorded yeah. in detail, and <laughs> then cool. countless others that are not recorded in detail. Wow. You see? Um, Pastor, did did anyone get the correct answer on Jeopardy? Uh the Jeopardy question was not about the miracles of Jesus or the number. I just said that one of the categories had 37 as the, the thing that was common to them all. Oh. It was a weird question. It was oh, so, so the answer was miracles. No, no. Uh, oh. The Jeopardy question just, just had the number 37. I'm sorry. My, my tangent was not useful. 
okay. <laughs> uh, I don't watch it every night, but Much like ours. Many other miracles are not described in detail, but simply listed in this way. And great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put him at his feet, and he healed them. So that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they glorified the God of Israel. You see, the summary statement shows that he fulfilled the prophecies especially those of Isaiah that said he was going to do these very things. And it's the same thing when John the Baptist sent his disciples to see if Jesus was the real thing or not. And Jesus says, when you go back, you tell John that you see the lame healed, the blind seeing, the crippled walking, and the mute speaking. Now, that's not quite an accurate quote. Wait. Where, Pastor, in the Bible can I review all this? Under, in this case, Matthew 15, 30, 31? This is a summary statement, but where in the Bible can you read all the miracles? The answer yes. is a little bit scattered because the answer is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yeah. And when you read them cover to cover, in each of them you will find some of the miracles. But none of the, okay. none of the gospel accounts have all 37. Yeah. I, I was going to try to put that chart of the 37 on the screen, but it's too large and too complicated. I was just say some, some of your Bibles will have a summary sheet with all of them listed also yes. and where you find them. Yes, and some of you can get on the internet and you can get that chart. If I find a way to send it to you, I will do that, but right now I don't have it in a way that I have a picture of it. Okay. Strokes are still very much with us. Pardon? Strokes are still very much with us. Yeah, strokes are... Uh, and we and, think and, of them being, being some, some, something of the past, but they are very dangerous. Yeah. And uh, we, we are very concerned if, if, if a loved one has a stroke, and you know uh, who was Jesus? He was one who was was go going through with uh, dangers. Yeah. And we 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 are aware of that. Uh, Pastor, you're speaking about your wife Patricia, who is recovering from a stroke. That's right. That's right. I'm glad you brought it up because that's what's what, what I was thinking of. Mm -hmm. I, we're very much as as a family, very much concerned about this. And your son and, John is doing a lot of care for her. Yes. Yes, he's do, he's doing. His, Carol has something to say. So that's was what I just want to mention. Uh, we, we, we kind of think of a stroke as well. That's that's a thing of the past. No. Well, it's very much with us. Yes. And, 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 and uh, yeah, I, I'm, I don't know how to finish this, but. Oh, you did fine. Uh, yeah. The Lord is with us. Yes. Especially yes. as you go through a time of going through the danger and and the strains that it puts on loved ones. Mm -hmm. well, I, oh. I've learned a lot about this in the last week or so. And uh, I solicit your prayers and that the Lord would heal and be with us. Yes. yes. Amen. We'll, we'll continue to pray for Patricia, your dear wife. Because yes. I know that you want her back as whole as the Lord will make her for you and for the family. Yes, yes. We pray for full recovery. Yes. And uh, she's very strong inside. She has a strong will. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> the right thing. Thank you so much.
<laughs> I'm, I'm saying that in a good sense. Yes. Thank, yes. thank you, Pastor, for, for sharing. Uh, we're going yeah. to pray now and, and close because our our time has been used yeah. up and I hope profitably. You, and we'll continue uh, next time, the Lord willing, that uh, we study some more of the miracles of Jesus. Um, I hope you'll be patient and we're not going to do all 37, but I think we have seven or eight more. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, then our list will be complete as far as the ones we're going to study together. And if I get that list in a way to send it to you when I send it, uh, the copy of the Bible. Yeah. Study. And especially I, I'm, I'm interested in, in Linda. Linda Young. Young. She, died, she died of, um, of a thing, uh, if I can remember the word, it means fainting spells. And it ends in C-O-P-E, syncope. Am I saying that right, Judy? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. it, it is a funny word that I don't understand how syncope applies to fainting spells. But well, it, it's the, general, general, yeah, sometimes it's caused by a blood pressure drop. Uh-huh. Um, I don't know in her case, um, but she had been subject to these for some time. It, it was totally unrelated to her blood cancer. Uh, and that was a relief to find out. Uh, but, uh, and she had just the day before received very good numbers. Mm -hmm. One of the numbers that was way out of range was brought within range uh, from the new medicine that she had been getting for several weeks. So it was kind of disheartening to have one day up and the next day she's with the Lord. Yeah. It was hard on the family. Yeah. And she was not that old, early 70s. I was going to say that's, I mean, it just was a shock. Yeah. It was. I, I would be c concerned and, 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 and pray for. You said, you said it to John. Linda is, Pastor Linda is, has, has died and she is with the Lord. Her uh, graveside was held last week. Yeah. But let us pray for the family as uh, they consider. I know Joanne is not with us this morning. Thank uh, you for your prayers. Lord God, uh, uh, bring us to the knowledge that you are in control of our lives. As we daily yield ourselves to your will, reading your word and praying to you for help when we are not able to do things. Give us the strength, the power, and the will to do your will and to praise you every day for the salvation that you have given us, that Jesus not only did miracles, he also was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Jesus, your Son, now lives to make intercession for us, and Jesus is the one whose blood covers our sin and brings us eternal life from which we will never die. We pray and praise you in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Pastor. Yeah. I'm gonna